honored that Rabbi Trump asked me to make a short video on some of the fear cautious, the four questions, and uh, he assigned me the first one, which is in many ways the most difficult, the question of dipping. What is this business with dipping? So before we get to the question itself, let me just point out that you know, why do we have these specific four questions? The truth is many early versions of the Haggadah have different questions, which are not the same as the four that we have here. And why are we reduced to, to these specific ones? Some of them have more than four questions. Some of them have actually less than four questions. In fact, famously in Gemara Psachim, Daf Kuf Tes Vav Amud Beis, we have this interesting Gemara, Lama Okrinesa Shulchan, why do we have to take away the table, right? This is in the context of the ancient world where Jews would sit on these uh, uh, kind of like chaise lounges called triclinia, and they would uh, eat leaning to the left, of course, and they instead of having one large table in Hellenistic times, they would have little tables in front of each of them. Kind of like when I was a kid and my mother would make me dinner to on a kind of those folding TV tables. Remember those? <laughs> right. Anyways, so why do we take away the table? In order that the children should see that something is different and they should ask about it. Abaye was an adopted child. His Very sadly, he was orphaned for both his mother and his father in his infancy. And so he was adopted by Rabbah. And so he's growing up in the home of Rabbah. And they saw, he saw that they took away the table. So he said, hey, uh, was Tutman. What's going on? Of course, he spoke Yiddish. Abai said to them, Adayan lo ka we didn't eat yet, and you're taking away the tables. Asu akre takami kaman, and you're taking away the tables now, right? This is, by the way, the source of the custom to remove the Seder plate during certain parts of the Seder in order to try and, like, spark the kid's attention. Amrle Raba, Raba said to his adoptive son, Patartan milomar manishtana, you have exempted us from the requirement to read the four questions, which is kind of a shame because that's really the best part, right? When the little kid gets up, sometimes maybe standing on the chair and then reads out the four questions. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing. But at any rate, the idea of this Gemara is that the questions themselves are not necessarily specifically pertinent. What is important is that the children have to be stimulated and ask questions about what's going on. In fact, uh, if you uh, look carefully at the Haggadah, you'll see that these fairly arcane questions are not even really answered. Like, do you remember anywhere in where the Haggadah where it says why we dip twice tonight? Why do we dip once anytime? We can actually reduce all the four questions to one word, which is basically why. Why are we doing this? That's the whole point, according to the Gemara, of what the four questions are all about. So let's provide those answers very quickly, and then I want to take us in a slightly different direction. Uh, the technical reason for the first dipping, which is the karpas in the salt water, is that we're supposed to emulate the Kohanim, the priests of the period of the temple, where they would have to wash before eating vegetables that were wet for reasons of spiritual defilement of Tuma and Tahara. We're supposed to treat ourselves like we are all Kohanim in that regard. The symbolism is, I think, more powerful. The idea that uh, the, the salt water represents the tears of the Jews who were enslaved in Egypt. Okay. The second dipping is the maror in the harosis, right? The bitter herbs in that mixture of cinnamon and stuff like that. Um, and there's actually three dippings. The Haggadah doesn't mention it, but we do it also a third time with Korech. The reason for that is because the Gemara says that the... Uh, the maror eaten on its own is potentially toxic, and you have to cut that toxicity by mixing it slightly with charosis. Some people like to pour on tons of charosis there. You can ask Rabbi Trump if that is appropriate or not. But at any rate, that's the technical reason. The symbolic reason is the mortar, that it represents the kind of cement mixture that the Jews had to use when they were building the uh, various temples and structures in the area of Goshen. Now, that, those are the technical and some symbolic reasons. There are lots of other ones available. And there's many Haggadahs as you can buy. You'll find lots of answers. But let's just go a little bit deeper for a minute. The whole idea, as we see from the way Abaye behaved at Rabba's table, is to uh, get the kids to ask. And when we explain the answer, we have to do our best to help them visualize 
what happened in Egypt. Right? We have the famous mission of Psachim, which is brought down in the Haggadah. Bechol dor v'dor chayev adam liros es atzmo ki'ilu hu yotzei min Israel. Every generation, a Jew has to regard him or herself as if he or she himself had exited Egypt. As the, the verse in Exodus 13 says, you shall teach your children on that day. The word for teaching there is higarita. Uh, because of this, God did for me and took me out of Egypt. So there's an important element here of using the questions as a lever to provoke this visualization. We don't have to go very far for this since we live in the post-Holocaust world where we remember the kind of evil things that were done to the Jews in the last two generations before us. And so it's it's still very, very fresh for us. But, you know, God willing, these, these memories will not be as immediate for future generations and they will have to imagine them. So how exactly do you do that? So I am so fascinated with this, of course, because I study history. And when you look back in the period of Exodus, there are a few really tantalizing bits of archaeological evidence that are so amazing. Like, for example, this papyrus document, which is actually a description of how bricks are to be made. Uh, we know that the region that the, uh, the Jews were most active in was in the region of Goshen, of course which is located in the eastern part of the Nile Delta around Tanis and Avaris. These are the places where Pitom and Ramses is described in the Tanakh were built. And we also have depictions of bricklayers and brick workers. These slaves were painted on the tomb of Rechmire around the 14th century before the common era. Absolutely fascinating. Just give you an imagination of what it must have been like to work in this kind of environment. And then most fascinating for me, some really amazing archeological discoveries have been made in that region of Goshen in just the last six years of uh, building pits. Now the whole area, as is uh, referenced by the Mishnah, is very, very marshy. And so structures don't tend to last very long, but amazingly they found some of these mud pits. And they're exactly like you would imagine or if you watch Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, this is what they would look like. Have a look at this image, which shows the frozen footprints of a young child in the mud pits. We don't know who made these footprints, which child made these footprints, whether it was an Egyptian child, a Hebrew slave, someone much later in time. It's impossible to really tell. But it is a very concrete way to help us and our children Imagine the suffering of the ancient Hebrews in Egypt being forced to work in these mud pits, even their own children, for such a long period of Egyptian servitude. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that in the merit of our discussion of the four questions, we will soon have all questions answered in the context of the complete redemption. Thank you very much and have a Chag Kasher V'Sameach.